Okay, it's time for us to begin our class. We appreciate you being here this morning. We're in the book of James, chapter 2. We're moving a little bit faster than normal, maybe, but uh, try to get through uh, chapter 2 even today if we can, which we really have to be moving real fast. But last week we talked about the ideas we began the chapter about showing partiality, and we talked about the partiality that was shown to the rich man and how they treated the poor man in a disrespectful way and talked about some of the reasons why that's, that's something we should not be involved in. Uh, number one, partiality is something that God does not show. And emphasize that from Acts chapter 10. The Apostle Peter pointed that out, that God's not one to show partiality, but in every nation, he says, they that fear God and, and keep His commandments, they're the ones that are going to be acceptable by God. It doesn't matter uh, about anything else. It's whether or not that person's willing to listen to God and obey Him. And we really get down to the point uh, today, uh, this morning, we're going to start uh, at, at about verse 8 uh, for this. It says, we should not show partiality because it's against the Word of God. And I will just read uh, these few verses here. I don't know if I put them on the screen or not, but yes. Uh, so chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, I'm reading from the New King James Version. James says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convinced by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. And so it talks about, first of all, the royal law. <clears throat> and some people believe that probably what's happening is that some of those people that James is writing to, uh, James is imagining maybe some objections they will have to what he's saying uh, about your sinning by showing partiality to the rich man. And so some may try to defend themselves, well, you know, by that royal law, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, but by that royal law, we're taught that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so when we treat that rich man with all kindness and find him a good place to sit down when he comes into worship. We're just following that royal law. We're just showing, you know, uh, that love for that, that uh, individual. But now, what would you say to suggest that they're not really following that law? You know, we, you know the law requires that we show love uh, for our brothers. Uh, we're commanded to, uh, to love our neighbor as ourself. There's a couple of passages in that in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. When Jesus talked about it in Matthew 19, 19, Jesus said, Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's taken from the Old Testament book uh, of Leviticus uh, that says basically the same thing. Leviticus 19, 18, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so here's that person said, Listen, that's what I'm doing. When that rich man comes in, I, I'm loving him because he's my neighbor, you know. Uh, everybody's my neighbor, and I love him as I should. And that's why I'm showing this respect to him and finding him a nice place to sit down. <clears throat> I'm just keeping that royal law. Is he? No. H how do you know he's not keeping it? Yeah, he's not applying it to that poor man. He's not loving that poor man as he loves himself because... You know, uh, he, he could care less about the poor man. We talked about, he says to him, you know, you stand there, you know. Uh, or if you have to sit down, you sit under my footstool. That's what, so he's not showing that same love to the poor man that he's showing to the rich man. He's just trying to justify his sin of partiality that he's talked about here. And that's the thing that's being talked about, why uh, he's, James brings this up. You know, if you keep that royal law, love your neighbors and yourself, you're doing good. Because that's something we should do. We need to practice that. But what does he mean when he talks about this royal law? Why is it called the royal law? Now we talked before, and we'll mention it again here in just a few moments, James does. He talks about the law of liberty. And we talked about that law. It's a law of liberty because it, it frees us from our sins. It frees us from the law of sin and death. <clears throat> it frees us from the old law of period. It is a law that gives liberty. But what is this royal law that he's talking about? The 
Does God have two different laws for His people? No. The royal law is the same thing as the liberty law of liberty, but why does He call it here a royal law? All right, number one, it's a higher law. It's a law that, that exceeds all the other laws that, that people might have. And that's one of the things that, that I want to point out here. That was number two. Number one, it's given by the king, Jesus. And so it's in that sense, it's a royal law. It comes from the king. Uh, but then like Brad said, it's also, it's the law above all other laws. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've talked about this before, but... You know, at the end of World War II, uh, the, the Nuremberg trials were held to, uh, <clears throat> to try those people who were accused of crimes against humanity. The Nazis who, who uh, were behind the killing of more than six million Jews, but not just Jews, there were others involved in this too, <clears throat> that were put to death. And uh, when the Nazis were brought to trial, they defended themselves by simply saying, you know, we're simply following the law that we had in Germany. And our law says we were to kill the Jews, and, and that's what we did. So we're simply following our laws. And it was interesting to me that Robert Jackson, who was a member of the United States Supreme Court, but also served in the Nuremberg trials as a prosecutor of it, when he spoke to that, he said, uh, you're not being tried by the laws of men. It's not the laws of America or Britain or France or the Soviet Union, uh, you're being tried by a higher law. One, he says, it transcends uh, uh, all other. It, it goes beyond all borders, and it goes beyond all time. You're being tried by a higher law. And that law that we're being tried by was the law of God. Uh, that God has always, uh, you know, it was his law, murder is wrong. Thou shalt not murder. And you've been guilty of it. And that's the law you're being tried by. It's something that just it exceeds any time limit or any border. And so it's, it's a higher law. And, and that's what this royal law is. It is a higher law. It supersedes all other laws. It supersedes the laws of America. And so here in America, hey, it's, it's all right to have an abortion. But God's law would say something different. And so God's law exceeds, it goes, it supersedes those laws. So that's, it's a royal law because it does that. Just like Brad said, it's above all other laws. But then thirdly, it's also the law for those of the royal priesthood. Uh, someone turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 uh, and verse 9. I don't believe I put that on the screen. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. you got that, raise your hand. But, all right, well, but, go ahead, Billy. We'll let you read that for you. Yes, sir. Is that, is that 1 Peter 2, 9? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9? Oh. <laughs> all right. No, it's 1 Peter 2, 9. No, no, it's chapter 2. <laughs> You're scaring me, Billy. So Peter's writing to Christians, and he tells these Christians, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And so, a royal priesthood. The royal law is the law that applies to those of us who are part of the royal priesthood. Every child of God is a priest of God. And so we're part of that royal priesthood, and we live and serve God under a royal law. And so if you're going to follow that royal law that God's given... You can't just apply it to some people and not apply it to others. You can't say, well, I, I, I love the rich people. That's why I'll treat them good. But I don't really care that much for the poor people, so I'm not going to treat them. 
with that loving kindness. I'm not going to behave that way. Well, if you do that, you're, you're guilty of sin in doing that. And that's the thing that James is going to get to here in, in regard to that. And he wants these brethren to understand that the showing of partiality is sin. Uh, so, showing partiality is sinful. Uh, if a person disobeys, disobeys the law, he says, in one point, uh, he's going to be guilty of all. Beginning at verse 9 again. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he's guilty of all. So, if you show partiality, you're guilty of sin. Uh, and that's why you can't be involved in it. We can't be involved in any sin in our life. And, and the statement he makes in is really interesting when he talks about that in, in verse 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. If you just commit one sin, he says you're guilty of all. Now what does he mean by that? If I commit one sin, I'm guilty of all? Yet yeah, one is all it takes for you to become a lawbreaker. You've broken the law. Uh, you know, you don't have to break every law that God's ever given. And, and James doesn't mean that, hey, if you commit a sin, as soon as you commit that sin, then you're certainly guilty of committing every sin that could be committed. That's not what he's talking about. But he's talking about when you commit a sin, you need to understand, to your eyes it may be a minor thing, oh, that's not important, but you have become a lawbreaker. You've committed sin. Uh, and, and he uses an illustration when he talks about that here. He says, For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, he says, If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. You don't have to break every law that God's given to become guilty uh, of breaking the law. As soon as you violate any one law that God's given then you become guilty of it. So if you keep all of God's law, but break it in one point, then you're guilty of breaking it. Uh, you're still showing yourself to be guilty of sin. Uh, some people think about showing partiality. You know, I just feel like that's not really such a big deal. You know, uh, after all, you know, I haven't committed a murder. I haven't robbed anybody. Uh, just showing partiality. There, there are most people who would think that's not really that big a sin. When you're a lawbreaker, you're a lawbreaker. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Brad. When you're a lawbreaker, you're a lawbreaker. Doesn't matter which law you've broken. And like uh, Steve, uh, one had pointed out to me one time about that, you know, any sin is, is sufficient to separate a person from God. And so any sin, whatever it is, is a serious thing. And we need to understand that. And so if you're showing partiality, you may not think that's very big uh, in the meter of rating sins, but it's still sin. And because of that, it can separate you from God, and you need to be careful not to be involved in doing that. Uh, when you break any law, you're still a lawbreaker. Yes, sir, Steve. Very good. Yeah, absolutely right. I never thought about that. But boy, when you, you that treating that poor man that way, because we pointed out when we talked about, you know, it, it's almost the way he says that, you know, you stand there, you know, or if you got to sit here, sit under my footstool. It, it was almost as it was given with the, the, the hint of, uh, uh, i trying to think of the word I want to use there for that. Uh, contempt for the person, you know. You're, you're, you're not worthy to sit here with us. But if you're going to be here, you stand way over there. Uh, and so, like Steve said, that, that's robbing that person uh, of their respect that they're deserving of, uh, of their uh, self-importance, because every one of us is important to God. And if we treat someone less than that, then we are, in that sense, robbing them of that dignity uh, that should be given to them. So it, it, it is a serious thing because it's sinful. Yeah. 
And we need to be careful not to allow ourselves to be involved in it. And then, to emphasize that even more, uh, we should not show partiality because James says judgment is sure. It, it's going to come. Uh, verses 12 and 13. James says, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So speak and so do. Both our words and our actions need to be such uh, by us realizing we're going to have to give an account for that someday. For by your words you shall be justified and by your words you shall be condemned. And certainly we recognize that's true by our actions, the things we do. And, and in reality, in the example that James gives here of showing partiality, both are involved, both their speaking and their actions. Uh, you stand there. That's their words. But then they're directing them over there, away from us. Or to the rich men, you sit here in a good place. And it's almost like you, you lead them over there to show them this is the best place we have to sit. You sit right here. So you've got both the words and the actions of the people being involved here. And, and we're going to be judged by those things. And so James is simply reminding these people that are showing partiality, you may think that it's nothing, but remember, we're all going to have to stand before God someday uh, to be judged by God, and that's going to be include judging by both our, our speaking and our doing. It's what we say and what we do. There'll be a, a means of, of bringing judgment upon us, and so we need to be careful about that. Uh, and I, and I love this fact here. Judgment, he says, will be without mercy for the person who shows no mercy. I say that because this is something that really wakes me up. Uh, th this is, is frightening. That if we don't show mercy to people in life, then we can expect mercy to be shown to us. I'm not sure, I, in, in one of the books that I read, I, I read a lot of history on World War II, and I believe that it was General Patton who made a statement in regard to the German army to fight against, you know, may God have mercy on your soul because I won't. Uh, wow. That's scary, isn't it? To think, uh, I, I'm not ever going to show mercy, I'm, you know, regardless. Well, the frightening thing about that sometimes, I, I, you know, there have been times when we get angry about something or someone and... You know, we get this attitude, boy, I'm not going to forgive them. Uh, I'll never forget what they've done to me. Uh, and then stop and think, listen, if that's the attitude you have, if you're not willing to show mercy to other people maybe who have offended you, hurt you in some way, then you can't expect God to show you that mercy. Uh, I don't know if I put this verse up here. Hopefully. Yeah, Matthew 5, 7. Jesus there in the Sermon on the Mount says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, that's on the positive side of it. That, that can make a person feel good. That when I go to, to stand in judgment before God, there's going to be that certain fear that you'll have because you think about, you'll remember back all the, the things I did that were wrong, every sin I committed and all this. But then to be reminded, here, here's what Jesus said. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If you've been merciful in your life toward other people, then you expect in the day of judgment that you'll be able to obtain mercy from God. And we talk about this a lot. Uh, what is mercy? Well, it, it comes with forgiveness, but... No, oh, that's grace. Grace is unmerited favor, and there's a difference between grace and mercy. Dave Ogden's one that, that brought that up to me one time, and I really appreciate it. Mercy is failure to receive what you deserve. You sin, you deserve punishment. You deserve condemnation. But mercy means you're not going to receive that. You're obtaining mercy. Uh, have any of you ever been pulled over by a policeman? 
I have. Uh, at least three times in my life that I can, I can remember being pulled over by a policeman. And I didn't argue with that policeman like I normally would argue. I didn't say, I want justice. I want ju No, I didn't want justice. Because I violated the law. And if I got justice, I would get punishment from the law. A fine or whatever would be imposed upon me. I wanted mercy. I wanted him to say, and I've had it happen, I've had him say to me, all right, I'm not going to write you out a ticket. But be careful from now on when you're driving. Watch what you're doing. Watch your speed. Make sure you stop completely at stop signs or red lights, whatever, you know. But he let me go without a ticket. I received what I didn't reserve, what I didn't deserve. I received mercy, and so I wasn't punished for the, the law I'd broken. <clears throat> and it's great to know that in the day of judgment, when we stand before God, that His children, who have been willing to show mercy to other people, can expect to obtain mercy from God. And and then the, the last thing that He says about it. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's really something <clears throat> that gives comfort uh, to a child of God who's doing his best to live for God the way he should. Uh, judgment is a frightening thing. Uh, you know, talk about falling into the hands of an angry God. Yeah, fearful. Of judgment but here's the promise mercy triumphs over judgment mercy overcomes judgment and so for the child of God who's doing his best to live for God and who's been willing to grant mercy to others who, who have in some way harmed him or hurt him in some way can expect to receive mercy from God and that mercy is going to triumph over judgment Judgment is what says you deserve this punishment. And mercy says, but you're not going to receive that punishment. Now, grace is receiving what you don't deserve. Do you see the difference? Mercy is not receiving what you do deserve, and grace is receiving what you don't deserve. I don't deserve life eternal. But it's by the grace of God that I can receive life eternal. So I'm receiving what I don't deserve. And so, James wants us to understand, when you think about partiality, you may think that's a minor thing, but understand it's still sin, and realize that sin brings judgment of God, and if you haven't shown mercy to others, you can't expect God to show mercy to you. But, if you have, take comfort in knowing that mercy triumphs over judgment. It wins out. Yes, sir, Billy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have an obligation, both on the positive and negative side in our life and how we live and what we do. Uh, and we need to, to do that. And so, judgment, uh, dangerous thing, and yet there's the promise that he makes that mercy uh, is something that triumphs over judgment. Now, the last few or several verses really here of this deals with the idea of faith, uh, the faith that saves. Being at verse 14 and really going through verse 26, but what I want to do is just Break this down and look, first of all, at verses 14 through 17. Uh, four different verses that, that talk about the idea that, that faith without works is dead. Because he's going to be talking about two different types of faith. So faith without works is dead. So we look at those verses. James says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them... Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? 
Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, just preliminary, before we really get into all this, to, to notice what he says. Uh, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but not, does not have works? Can faith save him? Uh, first of all, notice, I want to talk about, what is he talking about when he talks about works? Uh, we need to understand, first of all, he's not talking about works of merit. There's absolutely nothing anybody can do that puts God in their debt so that God has to give them salvation. He has to give us eternal life because look at all the good I've done. And I can't do enough good to ever merit that. Neither is he talking about the works of the law, that is, the Old Testament law. You can't earn your salvation. Uh, you know, somebody said, look, there, there's 600 and something laws given there under the Old Testament. And, and I kept 600 and out of 633, I kept 632 of them. I merit my salvation. No, you didn't. You broke one. So you merited death. And, and so you can't earn it. I think what he's talking about when he talks about, but does not have works, I think the context shows that the works he's talking about is your obedience to the commands of God. Now, we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but notice, uh, if you will, uh, beginning at about verse 20, he says, But do you not know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? There's the works that he did. Offering up his son on the well, that was what God had commanded him to do. So the works that he did that justified him was he was obedient to the commands of God. And so it's not by faith only. Uh, it's going to be by works. That is, our obedience to the Word of God. And then it says, can faith save him? Well, that's kind of, a, kind of misleading the way it's expressed there. Because, yes, faith can save. But really, I think what he's talking about there is, can that faith save him? Can faith, without obedience to the will of God, can that faith save you? And, and the answer is no. And he's going to go through and, and explain this. And again, James does this by, as he does so many times, giving such wonderful uh, illustrations of these things to help us see clearly and know uh, what he's talking about here. Uh, so he's discussing two kinds of faith. Uh, and he gives an illustration, faith, dead faith and live faith. He gives the illustration of a dead faith here. And, and here's that illustration. If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? And so here's someone that comes to you, whether he's a Christian or not, and, uh, and it's obvious, you know, uh, the clothes that he has on, it says naked. He's not literally naked, but uh, not properly clothed, not sufficiently clothed. Maybe what he has on is, is, is worn. Uh, and maybe it's, it's torn and everything. It's not sufficient to give him any warmth or comfort in it. Uh, and he doesn't have enough food to eat. He may have some food, but it's not enough really to sustain him uh, and to keep him where he's, he's healthy and, and, and vigorous, able to do for himself what he needs to do. And he comes to you in that need, and here's your response to it. Depart in peace. Now that expression was the normal farewell that the Jews gave to one another. And so here in essence, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm saying goodbye to you. Depart in peace. So, hey, <laughs> get on out. But you don't give them anything that's necessary uh, to clothe them or to feed them. He wants to know, what does it profit? That's a good question. What has it profited, that individual, who's naked and destitute of, of food, and you say, depart, be warmed and filled? What good has that done? They've done absolutely nothing to help them out. They've still got on those same old clothes. They're going away, uh, still lacking the food they really need. And so you haven't helped them at all. 
And so what James is doing is showing here the illustration about this. Uh, he says, when you do this, what does it profit? And the answer that expected is a negative answer. It doesn't profit at all. Uh, they're, they're leaving in the same state that they came to. They've got the same needs. Yes, sir? Judgments are guided by evil motives. Yeah. What verse is that on that Bible? James 3 and verse 4. Yeah. Uh-oh. I've got something different. Yeah, that, that's where we're talking about. We're going to get to that, hopefully, talking about the tongue and the power of it but anyhow let's look at this now as he talks about this uh there they even he's going to point out here that even the demons believe in christ uh and as a result of their faith in christ what do they do they shudder so what does that suggest they're fearful they know who jesus is they know about a judgment in fact, there, there are several times when this is brought out. Uh, and I don't know if I put these up here when we get to that. Uh, faith, number one, faith cannot be seen except by your actions. Uh, that's the only way you can know if a person has real faith or not. It's going to act in their lives. Uh, the demons believe there's only one God. That's what James points out to them. And, and they shudder. Uh, they're fearful because of that fact. Uh, but the demons are not going to be saved by that faith. I thought I'd put that up there, but evidently I did not. Uh, all right, someone turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 23 and 24 for us. Mark 1, 23 and 24. I really wanted to notice. man with an evil spirit in him, demon-possessed man, and, and is crying out, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And the question, you know, uh, that he raises, what are we to do with you? Did you come to destroy us? And in some of the other translations, it, it, it has something different. Here, let me read one more real quickly. Matthew 8, 28 and 29. It says, when he, it's talking about Jesus, when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? They, again, the, these demons are acknowledging who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. And, and, and they're concerned. Have you come, as they put it here, to torment us before the time? They knew, that's why they believed, but they also shuddered. They knew the power of Christ uh, from judgment and the punishment was coming to them. And, and have you come to torment us before our time? Now, so they believe in Christ. They acknowledge that faith they have in Him. But they're not saved by that faith. And James brings that out, just simply emphasizes it's possible that a person can believe in Christ and yet not be saved. If they, their faith is not evidenced by their obedience to God's will for them. And so faith has to act. It has to act in obedience. So these demons, you know, believe, but they're not saved by that faith. And that's why they shudder. Because they know the judgment that's coming upon them. Now, that's because this is what's called a dead faith, an inactive faith. It, it doesn't act 
to obey God, to do what God wants them to do. They're not doing the works of God. That is, they're not obeying the commands of God. Now, he goes on to give two examples here uh, of the living faith. Uh, and the first example that he gives is that of Abraham. And it's interesting to me the thing that he chooses to use about Abraham. Now, obviously, Abraham believed God, and that's been evidenced. Uh, you know, it's talked about over and over. But when James talks about it here, he uses when that faith was evidenced by Abraham's obedience to the command of God in sacrificing his son Isaac, his willingness to do that. Uh, now, God stops him. God doesn't let him carry through with the killing of his son. But Abraham has proved his faith by his willingness to do this. And God says, now I know. Well, of course, God knew already. God knows everything. But by experience, he knows that Abraham really believes in him because he's willing to obey God even to the point of giving up that son, that only son he has, that son through whom God says, I'm going to bless the, uh, the entire world through him. And... Uh, it showed the great faith that Abraham had in him. So it was after his faith acted uh, that, that Abraham uh, is accounted as being righteous, uh, James says. And then the second example that he gives is, is that of Rahab. Uh, that she also was justified by works uh, in saving uh, those spies that were sent to spy out the land of Jericho. Uh, she's the one that hid those spies and kept them hid. Uh, in order to preserve their lives. Uh, Joshua chapter 2, uh, verse 4, and at verse 6. Verse 4 says, Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. So when she's questioned about, about it, she lies. Uh, she does that to save those two men's lives. Uh, then in verse 6, But she had brought them up, to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order on the roof. So the faith that she has, I mean, she had heard about God. She had heard about what God had done. She tells these spies, we've heard about how he parted the Red Sea and y'all were able to pass through on dry ground. We heard how he destroyed the Egyptians that pursued after you. We heard how God had uh, given you victory over uh, the king of Bashan and uh, defeating him and she says, all the people of Jericho, their hearts have melted because they've heard about God. They believe, and they shuddered. Their hearts were melted, but they weren't saved. But Rahab was saved. Well, Rahab was saved because of her obedience. Sir? Oh, yeah, yeah. Long time ago that that had happened about the Red Sea and all that. But they had heard all that and they believed it. Uh, but that didn't save them. But Rahab acts on that faith that she had. She had heard the same stories and she believed it. But she acted. And she acted by saving the two spies that had come to the land. Saved their lives. And so James says that's how her faith showed itself. Her faith with the works brought it about her salvation. All right. Our time is gone. I see some of the other classes are emptying out already. Uh, but we want to begin at this point next week because there are several more things we want to say about the comparison he makes about faith, being alive, or dead, and how that would apply to us today. Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes before our worship hour begins. <laughs>